Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure. Chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! All right, all right. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Costello. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! Hey, Costello. Hey, Abbott! Hey, Abbott! Hey, Here I am. Uh, I know it. I'd put you there. All right. Why, why are you so late? Why are you late again? Why am I late again? Yes. Well, I've been helping my Uncle Tom Zizimers in his butcher shop in Baltimore. He's having a sale on lamb chops for $4 a pound. Wait a minute. He sells lamb chops for $4 a pound? Hmm. What does he pay for them wholesale? About six cents a piece. Then what makes the lamb chops so high? It's them little paper panties. The garment workers union don't, pay, don't work for nothing, you know. Right. <laughs> Neither do our writers. <laughs> We pay money for that. <laughs> well, that talk says. Why, why, why are you limping? Well, when I was coming to the studio tonight, a big dog in a parking lot bit me on the leg. I still have the dog. That dog might have rabies. Oh, gee, I hope he does. He'll name one after me. I... <laughs> ah, stop, you dummy! Was it? Was it? Ever anybody in your family that wasn't an idiot, Lou? Oh, sure, my great-grandfather. When George Washington crossed the Delaware, my great-grandfather, Valley Forge Costello, was the first man to jump out of the boat. He was? Yes, but Washington made him get back in the boat and go across anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, never mind that. What makes you look so tired? Didn't, didn't you get any sleep? Oh, I snored so loud, loud last night I kept waking myself up. Well, if you snored so loud, why, why didn't you do something about it? I did. I moved to another room. <laughs> And I dreamed about Marilyn all night long. Uh, by the way, how are, you, uh, how are you getting along with Marilyn? We're hitting it off pretty good. You are? Yep. I keep putting my head on her shoulder and she keeps hitting it off. <laughs> Costello. All right. <laughs> Costello, why don't you go back with the rest of the baboons? Okay. Any message? Get them out of here. <laughs> about? Boy, are we having trouble. What do you mean? My Uncle Mike and my Aunt May, they bought a houseboat on Lake Arrowhead, and they moved in Monday, and now Aunt May is missing. What happened? <laughs> Last night, she forgot and went down in the cellar for a jar of preserves. Mm. <laughs> have, there, have there been uh, any signs of her at all? Uh, only one clue. This morning, her apron came out of the water faucet in Pismo Beach. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have any cellar on the houseboat. Oh, that's too bad. No? That's too bad, Costello. You know, you know, my uncle was lost at sea. He went down with a ship. We felt terrible about it. I know how you feel, Abbott. My great-grandfather went down with his schooner. He did? <laughs> After three beers, he couldn't stand on his feet. <laughs> I'm talking about ships at sea. Have you ever been to sea? Oh, sure. I go to sea every Saturday night. You go to sea every Saturday night? Yeah, they have a burlesque show at the Burbank. I go to sea. <laughs> I thought so, you coward. You'd be afraid to go out on the ocean in a boat. How dare you call me a coward? 
I haven't got a cowardly bone in my body. You haven't? No, but there's some flesh I'm not sure of. <laughs> yeah, a whole family of cowards, Costello. I don't think any of them have ever went to sea. Oh, no. My brother Pat was in the Navy. Him and five other sailors were shipped on a desert island. There was only one girl on the island. My brother married her. One night he killed her. He shot her, strangled her, beat her. He poisoned her. And then he threw her in the ocean. But it could have been worse. It could. Yeah, she could have married the wrong guy. <laughs> Did any of you, the rest of your family ever go to sea, Lou? My whole family was sailors. My Uncle Tom used to be on a tanker. Where is he now? On a bender. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you talk sense. Now, take me. I love the sea. The sea, the sea is in my blood, Lou. Sailboats, steamboats, tugboats. They're all in my blood. Well, what? Everybody's got boats in their blood. Boats in their blood? Haven't you ever heard of blood vessels? But... <laughs> I should be working with a girl instead of you. I, I worked with a clever girl once, I remember. She wanted me for her husband. Yes, I remember too. Her husband wanted you for target practice. Huh? <laughs> well, anyway, I'm not like you. You've got your eyes on every girl you see. I have not got my eyes on every girl I see. You haven't? No, only those I can't get my hands on. I... <laughs> the trouble with you, Lou, is that you're not serious about women. No, and I'll never get serious about women. Never? Never. Well, I may get married and have eight or nine children, but that's as far as it'll go. <laughs> Costello, without a doubt, you have the lowest IQ of any man in California. I know it, Abbott, but I try not to act conceited. Right. <laughs> Costello, why don't you find a girl and get married? I found a new girl last week. You did? I call her my little pale face. Is she an Indian? No. Then why do you call her pale face? She's got a face like a pale. <laughs> Oh, let's talk sense. Well, what is the girl's right name? Amber. Amber. Was she named after the book? No, she was born on her way to the hospital between a red and green light. <laughs> Costello, no wonder you can't get a girl. You're too fat. Why, why don't you go to a Turkish bath and get some of that weight off? I spent all afternoon in that Turkish bath across from the studio. I put a quarter in a slot and hopped in. I... That's not a Turkish bath. That's a laundry mat. <laughs> yes, yes, a laundry mat where women rent machines to wash their clothes. I wondered why the manager came around and made me hang a towel over that little glass window. I... <laughs> you know, I heard it... someone say, yeah. what a bundle. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you should keep in shape, Lou. Wrap that joke up, can't we? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you be, 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 be like me, get in shape? Uh, get exercise. Years ago, I, I started planting. I planted things in my backyard, and it's kept me young. What did you plant? Your birth certificate? <laughs> <laughs> Costello, you are an idiot. You know absolutely nothing. That is not so. I was one of the smartest boys in my school. When I was in the fifth grade, I set a record. You did? Yes. I was the only kid in the fifth grade that was old enough to vote. <laughs> Always bragging about your school days. I'm the smart one of this team. You know, I remember when I started in high school. Well, I wasn't like the rest of those 15 and 16-year-old boys. Oh, you were 37. I... <laughs> Hello, boys. Well, look, Costello. It's our singing star, Marilyn Williams. Marilyn, you're late tonight. Oh, I'm so sorry, old boy. I was home listening to the shortwave radio from England. My favorite British program was on. It's called The Solitary Bovine Attendant and His Horse Pound Sterling. The Solitary Bovine Attendant and His Horse Pound Sterling? Yes, that's right. You know, over here it's called The Lone Ranger and Silver. <laughs> I get it. I listen to one of those programs every day. It's called... Strike the Jonathan Receptacle. Strike the Jonathan Receptacle? Yeah, hit the jackpot. <laughs> oh. I had a couple of English laughs there. Oh, yes, yes. yes. They was in parenthesis. I yes. didn't say them. <laughs> oh, rather, 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 rather. My favorite British program uh, on the wireless is called Seize the Condensers. Cease the condensers? Yes, stop the music. 
uh, clever than all that rot, eh? <laughs> Boys, you talk like a couple of typical Britishers. Costello, have you spent much time in England? Well, no, I haven't been in England since my great-grandmother died. I went to London to bury her. You buried your great-grandmother in London? Had to. Dead, you know. <laughs> 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 oh, Costello, you are so clever, Costello <laughs> You're making a big, big hit with her, Costello So go ahead and ask her for a date Okay, go ahead Now, Marilyn, how about you and I going to a nightclub after the program, eh? What? A nightclub? What's that? Well, in Hollywood, a nightclub is a place that's got what it takes to take what you've got <laughs> All right. Now, suppose I do go out with you, and when we get home on my front porch, suppose I were to throw my arms around you and hold you real tight, and then start to kiss you like this. Hmm. <laughs> what would you do? As soon as I see the script, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just lay there on a porch until a pull motor squad came. <laughs> well, never, never mind, Costello. You asked Marilyn to go out with you. Yes, Costello. Why don't you take me out to some swanky place where we can dine and dance? I would. <clears throat> I wouldn't, Marilyn. <know. laughs> I would, Marilyn, but I couldn't go to a place like that. I haven't got a decent suit to my name. Oh, no, Costello, I can straighten that out. I'll loan you one of my suits. Just, 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 just no. a minute. What right. Just a minute. <laughs> Do you think I'd wear one of your old suits? Do you? Do you think for one minute that Luke Costello would wear secondhand clothing on his back? Do you think I'd stoop so low as to clothe myself in one of your castaway suits? Yes. Well, don't stand there, you dope. Help me put it on! <laughs> And that's the halfway mark in tonight's laugh race. Time for an intermission. Costello. Let's turn on the spotlight. Let's turn it on on our singing gal from England. Oh, that's great for us. And it's great for everybody listening. Here she is, folks, Marilyn Williams with Maddie Malnick's music. I will gather stars out of the blue for you. Out of dew for you, for you. Over the highway and over the street, carpets of clover I'll lay at your feet. There's nothing in this world I wouldn't do. Up 
carpets of clover I'll lay at your feet There's nothing in this world I wouldn't do For you Hey, Costello, where were you last night? I called your house and, uh... Well, I went for a drive. A drive? You should see the car I'm driving now. The motor is in the back. The clutch and the brake pedals are on the right-hand side, and the steering wheel is on the back seat. Hey, say, how can I get a car like that? Easy. Just run into a sunset bus. <laughs> well, now you'll have to get a new car. I already bought one, Abbott. It's got two searchlights, two sets of seat covers, bumper guards, three heaters, twin radios, and fog lights. Well, never mind that. How's the motor? I didn't take the motor. No dealer is going to stick me with extra accessories. <laughs> is it a good car? Oh, you couldn't get a better car for $10,000. What did it cost you? $10,000. <laughs> Let's get on with the detective story. Uh, what case have you uh, picked for uh, Sam Shovel tonight? Well, Abbott, it's one of my most interesting cases. I call it the case of the grocer who fell in the wet concrete while building his new store, or he's stone cold dead in the market. <laughs> All right, let's get on with it. <laughs> yes, I'm Sam Shovel, private detective. I've been up all night working on a case. As I sit here in my little office, I'm tired. I start to doze. I'm taking a catnap. <laughs> it's a miserable night. It's raining a regular California rain. Out here, it rains the hard way. The hard way. Up. Just listen to that rain. Coming down in buckets. <laughs> Outside, there's a heavy Los Angeles fog. I can't wait for the fog to lift. You get such a beautiful view of the smog. <laughs> when the smog clears away, you can see the rain. When it stops raining, you get a beautiful view of the La Brea Top Hits. <laughs> That's when you start praying for more smog. <laughs> I walk to the window. I can see the mechanics in the garage across the street working on my car. They're tuning up my motor. <laughs> Well, it's time to get back to work. On my desk is a file on one of my famous cases. Willie the burglar. He was a crackerjack thief. He died broke. There ain't much money in stealing crackerjacks. <laughs> and there's another case, the case of murderer A.C. McGurk. I put him in an electric chair myself. I strapped A.C. McGurk in a chair and turned on the current. But it didn't kill him. I found out why. He was A.C. and the current was D.C. <laughs> Suddenly I remember I've got to make a phone call I have a party line I think I'll switch on my police radio Calling Patrolman Nichols Patrolman Owen Nichols Go to 49635 Elm Street. Fifteen gangsters are holding up a bank with machine guns. Attention! Car 71, 59, 106, 83 M. Tear gas car number seven. Rush immediately to Sunset and Vine. A car is parked in a passenger loading zone. That's all. <laughs> it's a good thing it wasn't parked near a fire hydrant. They'd have called out the National Guard. They got a fine police department here. One of the best is my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad. I'll never forget the time Chief wanted to make a mounted policeman out of Abbott. A mounted policeman. He wanted to stuff him with cotton and hang him over the fireplace. 
Abbott. Lieutenant Abbott used to be a hotel house detective. They fired him because he was too noisy. He's got a glass eye, and every time he put up the keyhole, it would rattle. <laughs> Hello, Sam Show. It's my pal, Lieutenant Abbott. Abbott, I haven't seen you for days. Where have you been? On the trail of Verillo gang. That Ver- Verillo gang? That tough gang? What a time I had capturing them. I nailed one of them in New Orleans. I nailed another one in Chicago. I nailed another one in Boston. Lieutenant Abbott never carries a gun, just a hammer and nails. <laughs> Sam Shovel. You've known me for years. You've got to admit one thing. They don't come any tougher than Lieutenant Abbott. I had to admit he was right. Lieutenant Abbott is plenty tough. He's got muscles of steel, an iron fist, and he smokes nickel cigars. <laughs> Sam, being a cop is no bed of roses. Remember before I was a detective how I used to pound a beat? Lieutenant Abbott used to pound a beat the hard way. The hard way. He pounded it with his head. (laughs) That's when they made him a detective. Now he's the most famous gumshoe on the force. Every place he gets, every place he goes, he gets gum on his shoes. I should have went with him. I got stuck myself. How are things at headquarters, Lieutenant Abbott? Well, we're having a little trouble, Sam. There's a guy trying to get revenge on the police force. Who is it? The guy that runs the fruit stand on the corner. Every time he passes the station, he swipes a policeman. (laughs) Now I got a new case on my hands. I got to find out who's smuggling jokes for Abbott into the script. (laughs) Sam, there's something I've got to tell you. It's something that is an encumbrance to my equanimity. Or equin... To my equanimity... What are you trying to tell me, Lieutenant? Well, Sam, I don't know how to say this. You didn't know how to say the last line either. (laughs) Why, you concern, gosh dang, bing busted, confounded... Lieutenant Abbott has a foul mouth. (laughs) But that's understandable. He's got a nose like a chicken, too. (laughs) Sam, I'm going to give it to you straight. Your brother's a crook. Your brother is the leader of one of the toughest mobs in this town. Okay, Lieutenant. Ten Jack King Queen Ace. What are you talking about? I'm giving it to you straight. That's the biggest straight you can get. This is... This is serious, Sam. Your brother's a crook. You've got to do something. I've tried to do something. I used to say to him, Joe, go straight, Joe. Get out of the racket, Joe. Joe, you're going to get in trouble. But Joe, he wouldn't listen. Why? His name is Pat. (laughs) (laughs) Three times I tried to put my brother Pat on the right track, but he wouldn't let me. Why not? The train was always coming. (laughs) Sam, your brother Pat is a thief. Yes, he's been stealing ever since he was a kid. Even in school, he'd steal paper from the supply closet. He stole so much paper that when the teacher wanted to give an examination, she had to bring the class over to our house. Sam. She left three kids after school. They've been with us ever since. (laughs) Sam, I know you're a brave man. And you're on the side of the law. Right, Lieutenant. That's why I came here. Sam, I know the headquarters of your brother's mob. I want you to come with me, Sam. You... You are going to arrest your own brother. Lieutenant. You mean you want me to arrest my own brother? A little sad music, please. I said sad. That's pitiful. Would the trumpet player please help out Matty Mallet, please? That's enough. Try using two lips now. (laughs) All right, Lieutenant. You want me to arrest my own brother. My little baby brother. The little brother that laid in the same crib with me. My little brother that shared his candy with me when we were kids. My brother, my own flesh and blood. My own brother. Sam, there's a thousand dollars reward for him. Let's go get the rat. (laughs) 
We're almost to your brother's mob hideout. Just a Sam. minute, Abbott. What? Sound man has another block to go. <laughs> Sam, why don't you get inside the car? You'd be more comfortable. I'm okay, Lieutenant. I'm riding on the running board. This car has no running board. Now he tells me. <laughs> Sam Shovel, this is the place. We're going in and arrest your brother. When we get inside, identify your brother. Point him out to me. Come on. Lieutenant, that's him over there behind the desk. The one with the ladder sticking out of his head. <laughs> Why does he have a ladder sticking out of his head? Well, he's really my stepbrother. <laughs> What are you two mugs doing in here? I'll... Just a minute. Well, if it ain't me brother, me kid brother Sam. Pat Shovel, my own flesh and blood. Well, Pat, it's 8.15. That was swell, Mabel. Thanks. I'll be back at 8.30. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Who was that dame? Oh, just one of the gals of my mob. She's our morale builder. Every 15 minutes, she goes around kissing all the boys and the mob. You mean you have girls in this mob? Sure, lots of them. Look through that door over there. See them gorgeous redheads, all ten of them there? When the gang gets true with a job, the girls sit in the fellas' laps. They stroke their brows. They make love to them. They soothe their noise. All right, Sam Shovel. Tell your brother why we're here. Brother Pat? Yes, Brother Sam? What do you want to say? Could you use two more guys in your mob? <laughs> There's a curtain call coming up, folks, but first you'll be interested in hearing this. going to do tonight? I think I'll sneak over to the Palladium and get me a girl. Oh, girls, girls, girls. That's all you think of. Well, a man is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of women. No, you mean the pursuit of happiness. You chase what you like, and I'll chase what I like. Good night, folks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ladies. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood by Charles Vanda and featuring Marilyn Williams and Matty Malnick in his orchestra. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station. <laughs>